G'day budgies and wedgies and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to take you through a full, detailed, comprehensive care guide and informational video on freshwater stingrays. Rays have quickly skyrocketed to becoming one of my most top three favourite fish to keep and they've really changed the course of my aquarium hobby as well. I'll start off by introducing you to my freshwater stingrays and then I'll go over their general care requirements. We'll start off with Pancake who was the first freshwater stingray I got and he was actually from an aquarist locally who was trying to rehome him. I've had Pancake for about four months now. He's an interesting stingray because he's a hybrid between a Mortora stingray and a Black Diamond stingray. Well, technically he's a hybrid hybrid. His dad was a hybrid between a Mortora and a Black Diamond and I believe his mum was a pure Mortora as far as I'm aware. There honestly could be other stingray genetics that are mixed into there as well, but he's a really interesting stingray and he's got these absolutely beautiful almost flower like patterning with hints of blue brown and gray a very very odd but stunning looking fish the second species I got a few weeks after is the absolutely beautiful maple she is a Motora stingray and I've sort of been naming my stingray as this sort of breakfasty cafe theme with pancake and maple being the maple syrup to his pancake she's an absolutely stunning pure Motora stingray the brown body with those bright vibrant yellow spots makes her a beautiful fish. And finally, I acquired my absolute dream species of freshwater stingray only a few weeks ago, and they are pure black diamond rays. And specifically, this is a strain called the Thousand Island Black Diamond, purely because of the abundance of white spots they have. And these fish were bred by Obsidian Exotics in Australia. They're actually an exotic fish specialist and they have absolutely awesome collections of freshwater stingrays and a whole bunch of other exotics. I'll have their YouTube channel linked in the description down below. They were able to give me an absolutely awesome deal on these rays. And I actually have named them Waffle and Crepe. Although they look the same, I actually can tell the difference between the two with the spot formations they have. It's just so awesome to finally have a species of fish that I've been wanting to get for many, many years. But this is a great segue into other stingray species and their genetics. Crepe, what are you doing? Get down from there. There's nothing there to eat, you mongoose. <laughs> She's so weird. So the Black Diamond Stingray is actually a captive bred strain of the wild Zingu River Ray, also known as the Leopoldi Stingray. Just based off pictures, you'll see how different these are compared to the black diamonds. Zinger River Rays have a lot more black on their body. The white spots are definitely more localized, much smaller. Whereas through the use of captive breeding and line breeding, you're able to get stingrays with a little bit less black and much larger, more abundant white spots. And that's where you get the black diamond. This can further be uh, sort of enhanced to get things like super spots, white diamonds, or even Thousand Island black diamonds like the ones I have. There are other common freshwater stingray species in the aquarium hobby like pearls, mantillas, and P14s, all of which now have their unique designer strains. The market for designer and hybrid stingrays has actually been increasing pretty quickly, not only in Australia, but from what I've observed around the world. These designer rays often give you more vibrancy or more unique designs compared to their wild counterparts. Although I still love my wild type or wildish looking stingrays, fish like Pancake really do make an exception to that rule. But now let's get into their care. With the two and a half stingray species that I've kept, I found that their care requirements are more or less the same. So I'm not really gonna focus on any particular species, but give you overarching rules that should definitely aid you in keeping no matter any species of stingray that you decide to get. And after that, I'll give you a couple of my personal experiences with the rays that I've got in my aquarium. Now, the main thing to understand about freshwater rays is size. These are big fish with males reaching around 40 centimeters or one and a half feet, and females get almost double that, closer to 80 centimeters or three feet. And these fish have a massive footprint as well. Caring for a three foot long fish in most cases sounds doable, but when it's also three feet wide as well and built like an absolute muscle blanket, that's a different story. And when it comes to tank size, that's when it can be a little bit more problematic. Growing freshwater rays out in smaller tanks is fine, which is actually what I'm doing now in my 150 gallon aquarium that's 5 feet long, 2 feet wide, and 2.1 feet tall. It's actually closest to 160 gallons, but 150, who really cares? But my personal rule is to not keep adult rays in anything under a three foot wide aquarium. I'm actually gonna be upgrading these rays to a much, much larger aquarium within the next four to five months, so I don't really need to worry about them outgrowing this aquarium for the moment. 
Ideally, the minimum tank size for around three to five rays would probably be something like an eight foot by four foot tank. The height isn't too much of a concern because freshwater rays, as obvious as it is, are mostly bottom dwelling. However, giving them something that's around 45 centimeters tall or one and a half feet as a minimum would be perfectly fine. The next key thing to know is water parameters. Stinger is a hardy fish for sure, but when parameters aren't to their needs, they show a response to it immediately and things can go downhill fast. When it comes to my way of fish keeping, I tend to focus just on ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and pH. And in the context of stingrays, when it comes to ammonia or nitrites, it needs to be zero. There's no real leeway around this. And nitrate can go up to 50 parts per million, but keeping it under 20 parts per million is gonna be most ideal. And when it comes to pH, you can maintain that between 6.5 to 7.5. Freshwater rays are also a tropical species, which means you should maintain the temperature around about 24 degrees and above. You could probably keep them up to 30. In my aquariums, I keep it between 26 to 28, which I think is a pretty good safety net, plus or minus one degree. So I reckon the 26 mark is probably what you should be shooting for, but a little bit warmer isn't gonna hurt them at all. Filtration is gonna be another big aspect with freshwater rays because it pretty much maintains a lot of your system parameters. And when it comes to keeping freshwater stingrays, there are fish that I would definitely recommend to keep with heavy duty filtration. These fish are constantly producing urea, which is pretty much ammonia. They're peeing it out 24 seven. So you really wanna make sure you've got good beneficial bacteria populations or else it can lead to an ammonia spike pretty quickly. Using a sump or a larger style pond canister filter is gonna be most ideal. In my aquarium, I have an inbuilt sump that's just caked with media. There's also an air stone under it to keep the media clean and while oxygenated so it's really supercharged and there is an absolute ton of media to house a ton of bacteria to go ahead and accommodate the waste production of these rays. Stingrays in my experience are pretty docile fish and I've never actually seen mine display any sort of aggression but they are opportunistic feeders. The main thing to realize with freshwater rays is that they love mouthing everything, whether it's hardscape, plants, or even fish in the tank, they love to get on top of them, smother them, and just taste them to see if that's something that they can eat. In a situation where you've got rocks or large fish, this isn't gonna be a problem, especially when they can escape. But when you've got smaller fish or slower moving fish that don't have that ability to get away from the rays, that's when it can be problematic because they can actually smother, even suffocate these fish and potentially just chew them up to death. I've actually experienced this in my tank when I had a black ghost knife. I was actually able to catch the time that it happened, but my big ray pancake got on top of this black ghost knife and just started to chew it up a little bit. I was able to intervene and pull the ghost knife out. He lives in my other tank now, but it is problematic. This issue though is mostly just with smaller bottom dwelling fish or slow moving fish. But if you keep any sort of larger cichlid, pretty much anything that you see swimming around this tank like clown loaches, cichlids, big catfish, they should all be perfectly fine. You might actually have a lot of luck with smaller fast moving fish that take up the mid to top portion of your tank like giant danios or rainbow fish in case you wanted to have stingrays in a lot more of an active community aquarium setting. One of my most favorite aspects of keeping freshwater stingrays is feeding them. And you will just be surprised when you see how worked up and excited they get for food. Hold on, actually, let me show you. So that was just the water I poured in from the thawed out fish I'm gonna be feeding them in a second. The scent of food alone gets these fish so excited. So you can imagine just how voraciously they eat. The thing I found with rays is that they eat a lot and they need to eat a lot. Underfeeding freshwater rays is a really quick way to lead to a whole bunch of health problems for them. They drop weight really quickly, which is why they need to have a good abundance of food. And freshwater rays should be fed with a range of foods. I personally like feeding them both fresh and pallet foods. With fresh foods, I give them a seafood mix, which has mussels, pippies, calamari, fish meat, and prawns. I also feed them a good quality high protein pallet, which offers all the other nutrition that the rays need. That should cover a lot of the basic requirements when it comes to keeping these fish. However, there are a few other really important things that I've learned just from my experience that I wanted to share with you as well. 
Firstly, let's talk about the barb on the end of the tail of these freshwater rays because they do in fact carry that venomous barb. It's pretty big in adult freshwater rays, but that doesn't necessarily make them a dangerous fish to keep. Well, in, in most cases. <laughs> Rays use their barb in self-defense, and it's sort of a last resort in most cases, because when a ray stabs something, the barb is basically designed to remain in the victim so the ray can speed off in the other direction. But you can imagine if the barb comes out, it leaves the ray defenseless for a period of time until it grows the barb back. So they really aren't harmful to keep unless you mess with them directly, or if you have a fish that's gonna pester them constantly. Now, if you were to be stabbed by a juvenile or adult freshwater stingray, it isn't gonna be fatal unless you have a severe allergic reaction to stingray venom. Whereas in saltwater stingrays, the venom is higher potency, so it can be fatal in a lot of stingray wound cases. However, in a situation where you are to be stabbed by a freshwater ray, the main thing you should do is run it under boiling hot water, as hot as you can tolerate, because heat actually denatures the stingray venom. Then you wanna immediately rush off to the hospital and uh, then go ahead and treat the actual wound. Now, in a lot of stingray cases, it isn't the venom that's problematic, it's actually the infection that happens afterwards because the venom is actually on the skin of the barb rather than the actual barb itself. The barb is almost just a bony knife, it's just a method to deliver the venom, but the venom is on the skin. So when the barb comes out and the skin still remains inside the wound, then it gets infected and then you have problems. But I can actually go ahead and play around with my rays. I've moved them when I've done water changes and I can get pretty close to them with my hands and not really spook them. The issue would be if I was to grab them or like hit them or, or harm them in some sort of way when they would get spooked and want to try and barb me. But I haven't had a situation like that. And it's not really an immediate worry that I have when it comes to working with my rays. Aside from that mild risk, these fish are an absolute blast to keep. But let's quickly just touch on the topic of breeding because I mentioned it before. Breeding freshwater rays in captivity is possible. It's becoming more and more common as people get larger aquariums and really understand how easy it is to care for these fish as long as you've got everything set up right at the start. Now, basically what the male will try and do is flip over the ray, the female, so it can impregnate her. In the wild or even in a large aquarium, you'll notice them doing almost like this sort of parallel swimming dance where the female will be on the bottom and the male will be on the top and they'll just sort of wave like this across the tank. Now, after the female's been impregnated, she'll have the pups in incubation basically inside her for three months. So they've got a three month gestation period. Then the female gives birth to live pups. If you're looking to get adult rays and want to get them breeding immediately, you'll notice certain signs like the fish swimming parallel with each other. The female might also have bite marks on the edge of her disc and that's just a male biting her to flip her over. In some cases, this can be pretty problematic if the male is just consistently slamming the female. And that's why a lot of ray breeders, once they know that the breeding has been done or they've given a period of time where they think the breeding will be done, they'll move the female or isolate her into a different part of the aquarium so she can just relax and focus on growing her pups inside her. Now, if you've reached this point in the video and you're like, yes, Bodgy, I wanna go ahead and get a freshwater stingray myself, there's a few things I would recommend for you to look out for before getting your first ray. The first thing is to make sure you're locating your fish from a good breeder. Now, your aquarium store should be able to do this depending on how specialized they are. However, you can always ask for photos of the parents or just have a look at your local community groups to see who is breeding rays around you. Having a look at the parents can often give you a good idea as to how the juveniles are gonna grow up Although this isn't always gonna be the case in the event of hybrid rays or designer rays because it's always just a bit of a spitball. Even the breeder themselves isn't necessarily gonna know what the pups are gonna look like. So if you are after pure rays, it will always be a good idea just to get photos of the parents. From my personal experience, I would always recommend to buy rays that are above the 13 to 15 centimeter mark. Basically anything that's above five inches purely because when you've got smaller rays, they tend to be more sensitive to aquarium change I've experienced this problem myself when I got a group of juvenile Mortoro stingrays. These were pretty much like newborn pups and they really didn't make it after a couple of weeks where they started to drop weight really quickly and they just didn't like the change in water parameters and the aquarium. So make sure that they're at least six to eight weeks old and that they've reached that size of around 13 to 15 centimeters. They're gonna be a lot more stable in your aquarium. And finally, if you're able to have a look at the ray, make sure that it's nice 
nice and fat. It might be a little bit hard to visualize that on a fish that's built like a, uh, a pancake. However, when you look at the tail, it should be nice and around with muscle. In between the eyes, there shouldn't be any huge dip. You should actually be able to see that it goes smoothly. In skinny rays, you'll be able to see almost like a circle where the eyes meet. It, it really dips in and you can almost see the structure of the bone. That's something that you don't want to see. That's something you want to avoid. So make sure you're getting a nice, chunky, healthy ray. And once you've brought your stingray home, it's always going to be best to temperature acclimate them. If they've been in transit for anything over 24 hours, then you definitely want to do the plop and drop method. But if it's just a drive from uh, your local aquarium store or a local breeder, then you can always try drip acclimating them as well so they slowly get used to your water parameters. A new rays can take a couple of days to settle in before they even start feeding. However, you can tempt that little feeding response pretty quickly by giving them a nice smelly oily food like prawns or chopped up fish. Then you can wean them onto pallets, which should be a pretty easy task, especially if you have a nice good quality protein rich high scent pallet as well. It makes a really good, uh, really good feeding option. Well, there you go. That's probably my most comprehensive care guide video I've ever done on this channel. And I'm actually super happy with the way that it turned out. I think that I managed to cover a lot of the things you should know before getting your first stingray, or even if you just wanted to learn about freshwater stingrays in the home aquarium, that should pretty much cover a lot of the basic knowledge. If you did enjoy this video, then feel free to give me a thumbs up and also let me know in the comment section down below if you have any further questions or wanted to know any other things about freshwater rays, I'll make sure to answer them for you. If you do end up liking this video and others on the channel, you can always consider subscribing as well. It'd do an absolute massive favor for the growth that we've been achieving so far. But thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, stay happy, stay safe, stay Australian. Bodgy out.